Hello, welcome back. Um, today we're talking to film composer Ella Jarman Pinto. Um, hello, Hi. Ella. Hello. <laughs> um, Ella and I have been working together for quite a few months now. Um, she writes music for film and TV, and we're going to talk today about um, making composition easier to understand and understanding how you can do it yourselves. Um, so would you like to introduce yourself, Ella? Oh, hi, yeah, um, I'm Ella Jarman Pinto. I'm a composer. Um, I write for film and TV. Um, my goal is to help film and TV production producers anchor their production so that um, when I say anchor their production, I mean um, using the music to hook people in and hook the audience in so that when they go away, they go away from actually watching it, they remember it because maybe the theme tune's in their head. Um, so that's that's my goal. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Um, so yeah, we were gonna, do you want to run us through then um, this uh, the idea that anyone can be a, a composer? Or yeah, you know, yeah. We're kind of yeah. a bit, I think. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. yeah. So often I um, talk to people and they're like, oh cool, you're a composer. What does that? What is that? <laughs> so it's writing music, and it's um, you know you've got lots of different forms of composition. You have songwriting, you have um, studio composition, which is um, the the work that you do in the in the studio. You've got live composition, working with people, live live instruments, um, and um, you know. But essentially, it's all about creating creating music and creating something either for yourself to enjoy or for other people to enjoy. So um, I am thoroughly in the of the opinion that everybody can compose. That's something that I really, really feel strongly about. Um, and, you know, people might come back to me and go, no, nah, I can't compose. I, I talk to a lot of a lot of uh, instrumentalists and also, you know, everyday people who might not play music in their everyday lives. Um, who are just like, oh, I could never do that. And I think, well, actually you can because composing, all it is is making a series of decisions and trusting your gut instinct on what you've, you know, of those deci decisions you've made. So um, if you, uh, for example, you know, want to write a piece of music, but you don't play an instrument, you can still write a piece of music really, really easily. Um, and uh, I mean, do you want me to go through that now? How 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 you can do it now? Is yeah. It now and <laughs> come up with, and so, you, uh, you can try it at home. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you can try this at home. So um, uh, I'll let you know uh, if you let me know, kind of what you think or what objects you think you could use in the comments after I've described this process. So setting you the task, if you are interested in composition, um, <clears throat> the task is to find something. Uh, let's say your kitchen, let's narrow down the options a little bit. Find something in your kitchen that you are interested in making a sound with. So I'm going to use the example of a wooden spoon. Nice and simple, nice and easy. Most of the kids know about these things. Um, so um, you've got a wooden spoon and our first instinct is to hit it with something, hit something with it. Um, so, you know, you take your wooden spoon and your next decision is, what am I gonna do with this? So you could hit something with it, you could find something else to hit the wooden spoon with, you could find two wooden spoons and smack them together. Um, but for the purpose of this exercise, I'm gonna say maybe you get pots and pans, you know, we've we've all we've all set our kids up and like retreated to another room with pots and pans and wooden spoons and gone, bye! <laughs> <laughs> So now I'm encouraging you as the adult to do this. Um, <clears throat> find some pots and pans and you're going to create a 30 second piece. And the way you do this is you've got your spoon, you've got your pots and pans, and you're just going to bang one after the other. One after the other. And you're going to listen to the different sounds that that makes. Keep repeating it. Get it in your head. That's the most important thing. Get it in your head. Um, when you feel like that's in your head, then you can change the order so bang the other way so like this maybe doesn't matter I mean that's also one of the interesting things about composition everyone's like oh, the decision's got to be right I've got to get it right and it's like no does not matter the end result is what you make of it but the process doesn't matter as long as you get something at the end that you feel happy with that you feel happy with no one else um is what what's important when you're learning um so you're banging it a different way now 
and then I want you to do it again. So you've got three different, um, three different lines, let's just say. So you've banged each pot and pan once in different orders three times. Um, and you can write these, you can write this down if you struggle to remember it. So you can write it down just using, you know, pot one, pot two, pot three, bowl. <laughs> you can do it that way. <laughs> One, um, and you just have that in front of you, and then I want you to play them in order over and over again. And when you feel happy with that, you can then experiment with banging one pot twice and then coming back. You can experiment with banging one really loudly and then banging the other soft. Um, you can experiment with getting a different wooden spoon and what that might sound, and um. <clears throat> And then at the end, you know, you write all this down. You could use words. Don't worry about notation. It's not important right now. Just use words. And then at the end, you've got a finished piece of music. And you could just use your phone to record yourself doing that. And that is your piece of music. So that's my challenge to you, anyone who's watching, um, to, you know, to, to do this. So find your, uh, find your thing. I can't remember what I was saying. Find your object. Decide what you want to do with it make choices that mean that you have three lines of sound um, and then you can change it up a little bit and then record it, record the ending. And then you've got this, you've got this finished piece of music. And the, the thing that you need to get out of it at this point, if you have never composed ever before, the thing you need to get out of it is a feeling of achievement and the feeling that all the way through, even if you don't know what you're doing, that you've gone with your gut decision and you've gone with what you like and then at the end of it, what that, that thing that you have created is yours and no one else's. Um, so it's not about getting it right. It's not about making it perfect. It's about making it yours and something that you have done and you have achieved. That's the most important thing. So let me know how you get on with that. Yeah, let's see some videos. Yeah. <laughs> so George, George here says, I have a, a clarinet and piano in the kitchen. Is that cheating? No. It, it's, not cheating. <laughs> it's not cheating at all, George. I, uh, I really think that, um, so my, my, uh, my idea with the objects is that, <clears throat> I would actually, actually I've changed my mind. I don't think it's cheating, but I would still encourage you to do the object one because it takes you away from what you know and from where you would usually go. So, uh, <laughs> well, the cruise set, you know, I think I think it's a bit of a higher sound. Um, um, yeah. So coming back to yeah, what, what you what you set what you already know. So often people get stuck because you've performed these pieces by the masters, and I'm going to call them the masters, and then I'm also going to do the masters, which is terrible. I'm sorry, but. <laughs> You know, I, I feel that people revere the old composition so much that actually then it puts the fear into them that they're never going to write anything like that. And no, you're not because you're not them. And you don't want to because they've done it. You know, what you want to do is to create something that's yours. So you can definitely do this on the clarinet and the piano using notes, using, um, yeah, just, you know, treating each key on the piano as a, as a you know, as a pot or a pan and look at it that way, still really simple, unless you've done this before and just, you know, compose. Um, but it's still really simple. But, <laughs> I think I compose them, but, <laughs> but not necessarily for pots and pans, so. Yeah, I, I would also <laughs> encourage you to kind of come out of what you know and move to something different so that actually you haven't got all that back, back kind of story in your head and you can just go with what feels good and for you rather than it needs to be like this, it needs to be pianistic, it needs to be all of this stuff you're taking away the should mm, yeah that's very very interesting to think about the process in these in these terms isn't it and um mm. it's a great thing about composition and music in general the amount of control it gives us and the amount of um working jeff okay <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, the kids, the kids have hidden them. They, I did give them wooden spoons the other day. <laughs> yeah, my son hates it when I play the piano. It's really annoying. I mean, it's fair enough. <laughs> you know, when you're sort of thinking, oh, I could use lockdown to become, I could do 10, 20 minutes piano practice a day and then I'd suddenly be like a bit better at it than I am now. And he's like, no, mummy, I want to do it. And then he's like, which is fine, actually. Yeah. I'd really rather hear it. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, um, 
That's great. Well, I think that's a good, yeah, I'm hoping we're going to get some videos. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or people telling us how they got on with it. Yeah. Um, so coming back to film and TV music then, um, yeah. and in particular theme tunes, did you want to talk a bit about how they get inside your head, how they become hummable? Um, yeah. So, um, so obviously, you know, I've been talking about how, um, you know, you start composition, you start doing this. Um, and then the more you do it, the more you kind of learn how, you know, it, 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 the, the process becomes less about you and more about your listener. Um, and, you know, that should be an organic process. I don't think that should be something that you're thinking of when you're starting out. But when you're at the point that you're writing to commission or when you're writing for uh, film producers and directors, you know, you really have to have their vision in your in your head because otherwise you're not doing your job properly. Um, but you've also got to take all of your knowledge and everything that you have learned, well, I have learned over the last 10, 10 or so years, um, and be able to kind of create something that, you know, when you're writing a theme tune, you're hooking the audience in as well as portraying the emotion of the, of the film. Um, and it's not just the emotion of a part of the film, it's an emotion of the entire film. So if you are, you know, you listen to the theme tune, you go, oh yeah, that's what happened. Loads of this stuff happened in the, in the, in the film um, or in the TV program. So, um, and there are lots of ways you can do this, but essentially it's always useful to kind of go back into actually how music works and how us humans are directly evolved to um, intercept um, the sound waves that, you know, we, we don't create music. We, we just, we just play with it. We just interweave it and we, we, we make things happen from it, but actually the sound that surround that, that lives in our environment, it, it's, it comes from space. <laughs> I feel like I'm speaking, speaking a bit woo now. Um, <laughs> we'll go into it in a different way. <laughs> it's all about the, um, harmonic sequence and the harmonic, uh, Oh, I call it the harmonic sequence. Is that the right? Well, I think what you mean is that there are sounds available and we can yeah. make them in different ways and manipulate them in different ways and, you know, find new ones by using different instruments or methods. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But yeah. So it, it, it kind of uh, boils down to this harmonic sequence. So I'm just going to say that that's the right term. I can't remember any other term, okay. but I know that there are two for, them for it. Um, okay. So it's essentially that you've got... Um, these sound waves that are coming, that they're just, they exist in the environment and um, they exist in the universe. Um, so these sound waves, um, each kind of tone that we hear, when I'm speaking a sound, when I say, la, thank you, Overtone Series, well, I, I, well, I think it's definitely harmonic series. Overtone Series is probably the same thing. I think it's, I think we're all kind of boiling down to the to the same thing. Um, but I will explain it in a better way because I've gone and got myself in a twist. I'll try again. <laughs> right. When we make a sound, whether it's a sung note or a spoken note, that sound to us sounds like one note, but actually it's made up of a huge number of partials. So you've got this one note here, which we're going to call the fundamental, and that's what you hear, and then you've got the huge range of partials coming above. And within that, you've got... Um, sounds that feel familiar for us so the fundamental go down there fundamental uh, the first one after the first harmonic after that is da 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 and things that feel familiar and therefore safe. So we as humans, we've therefore evolved into, uh, we've, we've evolved our music around these partials. So if you're talking about chord sequences, the hierarchy in, in kind of modern day, um, modern day kind of Western classical music and modern day Western pop, um, we've got, you know, chord one being important, chord five being important, chord three being, well, sorry, not chord three, but, you know, four is important. You've got the third in those triads. You know, we, we really think in this kind of way using those harmonic um, intervals, those harmonic partials. So, um, you know, it's something that feels really familiar for us. 
And then when you get to the dissonance, the dissonance of like minor seconds, so da, you know, where you got jaws coming in, da, 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 da. Um, because those um, those partials are closer together, and oh, I've gone and got got all mixed up again. I'm going back to the going back to the nice ones. Going back to the nice ones first. Because when you put those chords together, they sound really nice together. The waves, the uh, sound waves. Um, kind of are in synchronization with each other. It sounds good. It feels good. It physically feels good, not just sound. Physically feels good. Um, we we really like it. It makes us feel really good and buoyant. And that's why we've got like the major, um, yeah, major is happy when you're teaching kids. Um, then when moving on back to where I got stuck, um, then you come back to the um, uh, where you've got sounds that are uh, higher up in the the harmonic series where you can't actually hear them all that well. Um, their partials might overlap if you're so the sound the partials in term oh, I'm getting confused again. What on earth am I saying? <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm splitting hairs, I'm splitting hairs, so I'll forget about these people up here. Um <laughs> then using the chords that aren't like one and five and you're kind of um using intervals that are closer together then your partials are closer together and they're not going to work in harmony with each other. They're going to fight each other. It's like when you get like eight piccolos together and try and play something with them, you know, you get that buzzing. And that is buzzing and making you feel really uncomfortable. Um, and so, you know, and there are different ways that we can actually use this basic setup of something that feels good because the harmonic sequence, uh, the, the partials work nicely together and something that feels like not so good because they're fighting each other. It's essentially what I'm trying to say for the last five minutes. Um, <laughs> makes perfect sense. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there are lots of different ways we can manipulate these two, um, these two areas and you can manipulate them. I've been thinking about talking about pitch, but what's also interesting is that when you're looking at the instrument that's playing, so for example, the timbre, which is what we call the, the timbre, the sound of the note, the sound of the instrument that's playing, you can emphasize different partials in that harmonic secret series. So you've got, you know, if you've got a, a, an instrument that, for example, the piano, it sounds really bell-like, it's ringing, it's clear and, you know, um, very pleasant to listen to, essentially. Um, and then say you've got, for example, a singer who is going to make the sound that I'm about to make. So, uh, you know, it's not quite so fun. <laughs> and it's because I'm adjusting my, my, um, my vocal folds to kind of create other partials coming out. And you might have heard that there were two two notes that you could kind of really hear. It was almost like a chord, but it was, you know, it was buzzing and it was, um, and you could play that note on the piano and you can have the singer make that sound on the same note and you have a very different reaction to the two things. So you're not only looking at harmony, you're also looking at the timbre, how the actual thing sounds. And then you're looking at the, um, you know, if, if you're putting it those, just those two together, that's a huge thing. Then if you're looking at rhythm, looking at um, whether things are loud or quiet and, you know, moving from one to the other, you're playing with people's expectations. You're playing with their feelings about how these things physically feel. And you're playing with, um, uh, I can't remember the last point. You're playing with them, basically. And, and, you know, that's what all composers do. It's about moving the music and manipulating the music so that the audience is either brought along with you or the audience is surprised by what you're doing. And what you want to be doing at all times is to be giving that level of anticipation, something's happening, something's happening, um, you know, come with me, I'm gonna show you what's happening. You also want to be bringing in this feeling of, you know, there's the familiar going on, but also even if you've got the familiar, you want slight surprises that make you go, oh, isn't that nice? Oh, that's really lovely. Oh, I wasn't expecting that. So, you know, you don't ever want to kind of stick to the norm of, you know, like there are quite a few cliches going on in film at the moment. You know, we get trends. Um, yeah. I think trends are great because, you know, they work, but then once the audience understands it more 
and recognizes it more, then the audience gets a bit bored. Um, so it's always looking for ways to kind of keep the audience with you. And that it's that push and pull between familiar and unfamiliar and uh, feeling comfortable and feeling slightly on edge. Mm. <laughs> I think as well, I, I think film composers can also, um, depending on the genre that they're writing for, can actually manipulate how much people um, understand those expectations as well. Because sometimes my husband and I will be watching something and, you know, where someone really creepy has appeared and the music will be so blatant, will be something like, oh, do you think we're supposed to think he's friendly? You know, like, you know, <laughs> like it'll be so obvious, you know, and I think, but that's obviously, um, that's not that's deliberate on the part of the composer mm. I think like yeah. you know it depends yeah. on the quality of what you're watching but you know yeah. I think that it's definitely possible to um to exploit those expectations yeah. as well. I, mean, uh, I think yeah. you know all of us have sat through uh, you know watching someone eat cereal they're just sitting at a table eating cereal <laughs> you've got two different scenes one person eating cereal with like music that's really nice and bumbling over the top or just like really calm, oh, you know. Um, and then you've got another one where they're eating cereal, nothing has changed in the visuals, but you're sitting there with like your eyes over. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because yeah. yeah. you've got this yeah. and you've got like, you know, yeah. and nothing has changed apart from the music, but it totally changes the feeling of the scene. And, mm. you know, that's, I mean, that is the composer's job in that instance to tell the audience what on earth is going on and to, you know, and, and there are enough scenes as well where, like, you know, the music starts to rumble and you're like, oh, something's going to happen. And then it doesn't. But you know oh. that something will happen at some point, you know. That is the worst. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. You you know, that kind of anticipation. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So, you know, those, those are kind of really clear examples of how music can, you know, move you and also inform your audience of what's going on. So... A composer's job, I hate to really use the word manipulation, but I mean, it's true. The composer's job is to manipulate the audience's emotions and to, um, you know, to bring out certain emotions in the audience in order to, um, in order to, um, uh, uh, you know, in, in partnership with the film. Yeah, to sort of deepen and explain the plot in many ways. Yeah. Because um, I would say, if you watch a film with no music, you would notice immediately, even if you don't notice the music that much, yeah. when you are watching them, when they're, yeah, when if you when you watch, a, uh, you know, a film, um, like a part made where there isn't a soundtrack to it. Yeah. Like, you know, how much... Don't feel right. Yeah. <laughs> you, also get those, you also get those scenes when, you know, there's deliberately no music. Um I don't know if I'm remembering correctly, but like there is a there is a scene in Spider Man from like 10, 15 years ago um, when it came out that um, maybe I should update my references. Um, but, you know, it's stuck in my head because I have this image of this man, you know, Spider Man falling, and you know, Spider Man falling, and there being no music behind it. All you're listening to is the sound of him falling, and. Yeah been full-on music soundtrack in the back of this the whole way through and then suddenly there's nothing and I have such a vivid image of it because because oh I'm just frozen for a moment there I don't know what people can see but I can see Ella frozen mid emphatic uh <laughs> demonstration of the scene from Spider-Man um we'll just give it a minute and see whether she can come back. Um, how's everyone getting on with the wooden spoons? Anyone doing it? This is the first time this has happened to me on one of these. Um, well, while we're seeing if we can fix it, I will tell you a bit about what we've coming up. We've got coming up next week um, on our live series. So next week we've changed the schedule slightly because oh, ah, I'm back. <laughs> <laughs> So I don't know what everyone else heard, but the last thing I heard was you were just explaining the um, why the Spider-Man scene has has stayed in your mind so much because of the lack of music. Oh, how, how how far did you get through that? Did I finish saying it? I think you'd nearly finished. Yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. Basically, yeah, just the movement between 
this is the difference between um, the music, you know, being there and then stopping. You know, sometimes silence is the most powerful thing you can do. And, you know, that's also, you know, that that decision for such a long scene is, you know, definitely a director's um, a director's kind of decision. But I think, you know, silence within music as well, you know, when to when to create pockets of silence, it can it can just lift everything. Mm, absolutely. <laughs> um, so it seems as though the internet problem seems uh, because your husband's using it downstairs. <laughs> oh, I don't know, baby. <laughs> I mean, and the internet's fine. Oh, okay. Um, well, that's all right. <laughs> we have a question, and I did. I think I forgot to say at the beginning actually um, that, uh, that uh, yeah, any questions for Ella, just um, pop them in the comments, and we'll and we'll come to them. But we do have a question, which is: since composition essentially comes from the heart, how are you able to compose for a film that does not speak to your heart? I think that's a really good point and I think the answer is is you don't I think that I think that's the clearest answer you know if there is a film that comes to you and you don't want you do really you've got to watch this film over and over and over and over and over again I mean like I've heard of you know composers who have been watching you know really kind of hard films you know stuff that makes you cry you know and they're, they're having to deal with this over and over and over again and you have to you know, not only for your mental health, be able to, you know, deal with that, but also I think, I mean, eventually you kind of, you dehumanize, dehumanize to it. But, mm. you know, when I have been watching actors, like each time I watch it, I've got different opinion of what's happening and a different feeling, and I've got to engage with what's going on. And, you know, if you, if you don't agree with what's going on, yeah, you still have to earn, but I also think it's really important in life to do what, you know, I'm not a composer because um, because I don't want to be a composer. I'm a composer because I actually really want to compose for my living. So um, if I don't want to work on a certain film that that you know isn't, isn't going to work for me, and then I'm not going to write the best music. You know, like you're right. You're right. Music comes from your heart. Sorry, I've just I've answered another question that Martin's put in without actually saying what he was saying. <laughs> he said, "But you still have to earn." Yes, yeah. you still have to earn, and that's where the business skills come in. That's where they come in. They need to be separate from the composition. Um, but it's like any anything, you know, working on a film, you've got to work really closely with the director. You've got to work um, really closely with the producers. But director, composer. Um, collaboration is the most important thing because you write something well they've first got to you know tell you your vision and then you write something and you've got to you know and they've got to come back to you and be able to say I don't like it <laughs> they've got to say yeah. I don't like it and you have to go okay what do I do now yeah. um, you know and you come up with something different or you work with them if you don't trust each other if they don't trust that you're going to get there eventually because you know essentially you're trying to create something for them if they don't trust that you're not going to work well together if I can't if I don't feel that they're able to feed back to me in a, an open and honest way then we're not going to work well together mm. because you're right music does come from the heart you know yes I've got skills yes I've learned yes I've trained but you know I've written pieces which are angry pieces because I was angry at that point I've written pieces which are brutally sad because I was desperately sad at that point um you know you you really have to feel that your heart is in a project and if it's not then the best thing for you to do is to refer it on to someone else and you will probably get better feedback for having done that I, I would agree in the, in terms of you know the advice that I might give a client in that situation if you really don't think that you can get behind the vision that a director has or that um, the, or, or whatever, then I don't think that you would write music that was from the heart, and I don't think that your reputation would ultimately um, be benefited from doing no. that work. No. Um, no. Having said that, I do. Well, I mean, obviously, um, getting into hypotheticals here, but I I find that um, when you get into a project, it's and and you kind of do if, as long as you you know it's kind of a, roughly along the right lines that you can mm. get really to like a different point of view and oh you know, yeah totally. like, but yeah no I, I definitely agree that if that's not totally possible, then, uh, yeah then I mean I think you know I think you know there are there are things that in my head you know I've, I've said you know I, I, I will I will try most things and I will happily talk about you know op options you know if someone comes to me with a film and I go oh okay I'm not so sure but let's let's talk more about it and I'd like to yeah. kind of know more about it and then 
And then if it works, you know, if I'm intrigued or if I think that's going to be a great working relationship with the director, yeah, I'll go for it. Um, but it's really like, comes out of a collaboration as well, doesn't it? Because the only yeah. example that I can really think of, apart from the possibility that maybe someone was making a film about just some subject matter that was so despicable that you couldn't touch it, but even that, I don't know. But the only real reason I could think of why that would be a problem would be is if you couldn't work with the team, if their ideals, and, and that would essentially mean that they weren't able to work with you because they wouldn't be prepared to listen to what you had to say, in which case it's actually a case of... Um, uh, you know of that's something you need in every job is mm -hmm. especially ones where you're working short term with somebody yeah. is, is to be able to um collaborate and for your expertise to be to be recognized and used essentially yeah. um yeah. So, yeah. The, the most important thing for me is the collaboration and it is the 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 uh, co communication between the two you know um i i i feel like if if you are if you are worried about, if you know, for example, if you're a director and the composer's given you something and you're like, I hate it and I don't know what to do now. And you're going to, instead of go back to the composer and say, you know, this isn't for me. Can we look at it in a different angle? Can we look at it from this way? Do this, do this, do this, have an open and honest conversation. And that is fantastic. And that that is something I totally welcome. But mm. if you've got a situation where the director's like, I don't know how to say that I don't like this, or I, you know, I'm just going to kind of brush it off, or I'm not going to really give real reasons for why I don't like it, because I'm too scared to actually say I don't like it. And most people don't realise they're doing this, you know, this is, mm. this is everyday skills that, you know, everyone works in different ways. Um, but it, it can kind of, it erodes the composer's confidence and in their ability to actually give what they want, you know, especially if the director goes, okay, now I'm going to, you know, you know what, it's not going to, we're out of time, I'm going to take over, you just send me what you've got and I'll write the rest of it. It's like, actually, that is a, you know, that's a, yeah. a, really, a really hard thing to deal with because <clears throat> it shows that the director just cannot trust that they cannot trust the composer. And that doesn't mean the composer is not good enough. It just means that the director is struggling to kind of, uh, struggling to communicate. Um, and that goes both ways. You know, a composer might be there, you know, getting feedback and going, I can't cope with this feedback. This feedback is making me feel really upset. And, you know, how can they not like my music? Of course, I've, this is right. I think this is best. I don't know how I can do it. You know, so it goes both ways. You well, got, and you also might want to go back and have more conversations, mightn't you, as a director? Mm -hmm. if you don't really feel like you can get a handle on a certain thing. Yeah. In a good collaboration, it's good to be able to say, I'm not really getting this, you know, can we talk through the motivation more or something like yeah. that? Or, you yeah. know, in one of those untrustful relationships, you might feel like, you know, one might feel less inclined to do that. Yeah. Um, this is something I experience in my own work all the time with working with quite a lot of clients is that, um, you know, the, um, there is, you know, and working so remotely and, and not seeing them face to face very often is there is always the worry that someone will have a problem with something and, and the worst thing they could possibly do would be to not tell me about yes. it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. It's like, you know, talk, 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 yeah, talk. Yeah. The most important thing. Absolutely. Exactly. Yeah. Absolutely. Couldn't agree more. Yeah. So we have another question. Is there financial pressure in terms of the number of instruments you can write for or can you go for symphony orchestra? It's all to do is this in terms of the if, it, if this is in terms of film, it's all to do with the film budget all to do with the film. Yeah. So um, obviously if someone comes to me and they want to write, you know, they, they want me to create a piece of music, they don't want it to be live instruments, they just want me to use the equipment I've got. Um, I've got sample libraries um, and I can do uh, certain elements of home recording as well, um, you know, in order to kind of manipulate the sound. So it would be, it would be kind of a mixture of, it might sound orchestral, it might sound slightly more um, so, so slightly more um, electroacoustic, um, you know. So it really th then then that will be a certain budget. That, mm. That's the really, that's really, really really budget. Yeah. Um, if they want, you know, instruments and they want, you know, an orchestra or they want live instruments, which I always think actually is a great thing. I think it's really important because again, there's that timbre; it changes the sound. Um, but you know, obviously. 
everyone's got different budgetary constraints. Um, but it, yeah, it all depends. If they want those live instruments, then we're looking at um, working in a slightly different way. You've got to have a recording session. You've got to give the um, instrumentalists, you know, time to rehearse. You've got to have a conductor. Um, so, you know, and there are, there are lots of different ways to do it. There's remote recording as well at the moment, especially with the lockdown. Lots of people, lots of ensembles are moving to remote recording and they can kind of get that, that done. And that might be an, a way to move forward in the future that's um, to kind of explore better. But I know people were doing it before lockdown as well. So it really depends. It all depends on what the, what the, the producers and director are looking for. Um, and then I just right to that basically um and you know obviously i'll give my give my kind of my input on what you know i for example i had had someone say i want this sound and they showed it to me and i was like well you're not going to get that sound from my sample library because that involves a certain there's a gliss on a string but like ee, 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 like that kind of sound it's like that is a sound that needs to have been pre-recorded it won't happen in a sample library it's not going to sound very good if i try and recreate it on a synth string mm. um i highly recommend we don't try and do this <laughs> <laughs> and and you know the amount of budget that you know the budget and time that we have at this moment in time that it's it's not going you're not going to get that sound um and i can try and recreate it in a different way for you so you know it, it, like it all it all depends on budget that's 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 yeah. it, <laughs> and that's the really brilliant thing about it and the thing that i think is quite often not understood about um film and tv composition is the level of detail and collaboration um that is that is ideal to create the very best soundtracks you know to to be able to get a director and a film team with vision and a composer with vision and both of them with skills um and to bring those things together um you know that's where the really the really great soundtracks come from i think yeah absolutely it is it's the collaboration and i'm all you know i'm all about the co collaboration i feel like if you um so I've just seen <laughs> <my troll again. laughs> got a troll <laughs> um you know i i think that's the thing with any creative project you know it's 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 throughout society and every single creative project. It's about the process. It's about the human interaction and the process. And if you've got the human interaction, if you've got that, that creative process that feels honest and feels vibrant and feels exciting. And, you know, it doesn't mass doesn't mean that there aren't challenges or that you, you're still having to learn how to talk to each other. Um, but it, it feels good. You know, you feel like I want to, push through these challenges I want to focus on this I want to work with this person um then you then you basically are onto a winner because you know it comes through at the end it comes through yeah. at the end it's all about that positive interaction communication honesty yeah <laughs> Couldn't agree more. <laughs> Lovely. Well, I, th I expect the uh, wooden spoon related compositions are still ongoing at the moment. So <laughs> they're ready. Thank you so much, Ella. It was so lovely to chat. Oh, well, thank um, you for having thank me. You for telling us about that um <laughs> when you'd frozen i started to tell people what was going to happen next week um on our live series so i'll i'll finish that i think if i can remember i was just at that moment trying to work out if i could remember uh, i think <laughs> next week we've got a slight change of schedule because of um various things like childcare and teaching schedules of the people of the guests that we have on i believe um that we have um margaret and dale's um fabulous comedy night on uh, Wednesday evening as usual at 8 30. Um, I heard a rumor that the theme was going to be something like Berlioz Harold in lockdown uh, <laughs> so I'll let them let you know what that means um, on Friday we have uh, guests from um, the Come and Sing Company, which is a company that we've been working with quite a bit who um, do really exciting singing projects um, with with well with lots of people but particularly with schools and music services and have um recently got um their first booking in lockdown which is very exciting um and uh for a remote project i should add for anyone please and uh, 
<laughs> and then on Sunday, we are talking to Duo Tandem, who are a guitar duo whose new album with Naxos is launching this Friday. Oh. Um, I wonder if one of my colleagues can pop the pre-order link to that in the comments, because that is um, really must listen to. It's an absolutely brilliant album of uh, Cypriot music by Kamal Balavi. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so that's what we have on next week. And I sincerely hope I'm right about that. But our uh, our little list will be coming out soon anyway. Um, so thank you for joining us today. And uh, oh, to find you. out more about what uh, upcoming events are definitely coming up and receive latest guides and advice for developing your career as a mission, please sign up to our mailing list on our website, which is polyphonyarts.com forward slash mailing dash. Sorry polyphonyarts.com forward slash mailing dash list. That is what you need <laughs> to sign up to. Um, and do follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Polyphony Arts as well. Um, and yeah, if you'd like us to cover any particular topics or you'd like to leave us a review on Facebook or anything like that, we would love to hear from you. Um, <laughs> and on that note, um, just had one final comment don't hector the audience so on that note we'll say goodbye thank you so much Ella. thank, thank you <laughs> take care bye